And um, uh, so No Direction Home is a, um, a direct community which has been running for six years. Um, we've done 30 events now. Today is the 30th event. Um, right. And obviously before we had the COVID situation, we were doing live events and we have done some amazing events. We did a live screening of the conversation with Walter Murch and interviewed him on stage at the Curzon cool. Soho. We've had Mike yeah. Lee. Um, we've had Tony Grissoni, um, who I believe you know well. All too well, yes. Yes. Um, so uh, we we basically have um, a really nice community of um, six or seven hundred um, working directors, um, and essentially what we do is interviews like this, where we invite people to come and talk about um, their experiences and, and kind of share that. And obviously, um, we do that if we can um, to help publicise um, releases. Um, if we get to people at the right time to to help publicise what's going on with their film work. So um, yeah, that's what we're doing today. Excellent. Apologies that I kept forgetting what the what the parameters of this were. We've just been extremely busy with various things lately, so I'm getting confused. So. Uh, not at all. Um, yes, yeah, so, uh, <laughs> we'll we'll, uh, we'll schedule this for about an hour if that's okay. We don't want to take that's up cool. uh, yep. more of your time than, than we need to. But I know that is cool. A bunch of people who are going to be um, uh, logging on. We already have um, uh, kind of fifteen or twenty people on already, um, and um, more will join as we go. Um, so. Um, uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I watched the film um, a couple of days ago um, through a link from um, from Mike, um, and um, yeah, uh, it's um, one of those uh, kind of odysseys where you kind of feel the sort of the, the weight of the the the, the quest that that, that um, Terry is is on. Um, maybe we can um, uh, just sort of give a quick um, brief intro and, and and run down your career very quickly, if that's okay for everyone. Um, so um, uh, please um, welcome everyone, um, Keith Fulton and Louis Pepe. Um, um, and um, they've been working together um, for 20 years and they've worked in both documentary and fiction. Um, and they might be best known for um, some of their collaborations um, with Terry Gilliam. Um, so obviously um, that began with um, The Hamster Factor, um, which was uh, back in 1995, which was about the making of 12 Monkeys, um, and then kind of followed on with um, Lost in La Mancha. I do have my, my DVD um, here, um, and um, I, don't, I don't know how many... I don't know how many filmmakers, some of, some of us have been chatting about this as, as we knew you guys were coming on, but I think um, this film is one of those films that you kind of have in your, your, um, your DVD collection, maybe sitting next to um, Overnight, the, uh, the Troy Duffy um, story, um, as one of those kind of um, uh, tales of filmmaking that you kind of think, wow, it's, it's, um, you know, it's, it's the extreme edge of, of where things can go to. Um, and obviously what we're doing today is talking about your new film, um, which is based um, around the making of The Man Who Killed Don Quixote, which came out in 2018. Um, so welcome, guys, and thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for much. having us. Um, can I ask um, uh, how you guys met and, and, and um, when you um, sort of started working together? So obviously The Hamster the Factor was the first thing that you um, maybe collaborated on back in 95. Did you meet a long time before that? Had you known each other for a while? We actually met in 1990. We started the graduate film program at Temple University in Philadelphia. So that's when we met. We actually worked together on a lot of uh, film school projects prior to embarking on The Hamster Factor. So yeah, we were quite accustomed to working together. We'd never made a documentary, a feature documentary together. Um, but yeah, the, we, we'd collaborated quite a bit before. And, and how did the, um, the Hamster Factor um, come about? Did you have a connection with Terry or, or how, how did you get to um, be in that position to, to start working on, on films that he was making? Um, 12 Monkeys was coming to Philadelphia uh, they were filming in Philadelphia and uh, Terry wanted somebody to uh, shoot some behind the scenes video for him. I think he very often has somebody uh, shooting stuff as he's making a film and um, his assistant contacted, uh, you know, through a chain of people uh, and, and because we were students in film school, we got on a list of, of people that were interviewed and uh, one of the things that we did was we cut together a reel of clips from our very strange film school projects um, to submit to Terry to give him a sense of who we were. Uh, I had made a documentary about people's emotional responses to roadkill and running over animals and uh, Keith had made a documentary about Philadelphia's community of uh, competitive Benjamin Franklin impersonators oh. um, and and the mix of those two things I think piqued Terry's interest and and we got an interview with him so 
and so um, you, you went to go and meet him before he kind of said yes. You, you, went, you didn't just walk onto the set. You had to go and chat with him. Yeah. yeah we, and, and go ahead, Keith. No, I we, we mean, we were vetted first by his assistant and various other people. And then we got to meet Terry. And, um, you know, part of our argument was that he was saying, oh, I'm just going to get one person to follow me around. But, you know, we, we were saying, oh, two people really would be much better for the money, which was no, no money, you know. So <laughs> um, we talked him into it. Uh, but, you know, at the time, we, we didn't know that we were going to be following him for an entire year. You know, I mean, we, we, we just didn't give up with that one. We, we kept going until the very end, until 12 Monkeys came out. So, and, um, and as you see, the, the, the documentary, you know, gets into a lot of things in, in post-production, marketing and editing and all kinds of stuff that yeah. uh, you don't usually get to see in making of documentaries. Well, I watched The Hamster Factor again today, actually, and um, I was uh, really impressed by like quite how kind of um, a minutiae oriented it was in terms of sort of like getting mm -hmm. into the process that maybe for a, a you know a, a wider or, or broader audience, um, a, but for a filmmaking audience, it's like gold because you know you're you're yeah. wanting to as a young filmmaker go through that process, and so getting to see those insights is just incredibly valuable. Do you appreciate the texture of the high eight video? That's. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, I, think, I, think, I, think, I think that's one of the nice things about um, about the documentary, which which maybe is going to be sort of dying out as as people are now filming everything on HD at, at the moment. Yeah. So I'm not sure if you may know this, but I made a film about um, Bill Hicks called American the Bill Hicks Story, and one of the things that we were amazed to find was that his father was a very keen Super Eight recorder and had recorded all of these amazing moments from their childhood so we had that mm -hmm. to work with but what you do get to see is that progression of the film stock like kind of bringing you up to, right. to to the modern kind of day um and i think that's really nice because it obviously just has that historical kind of context you know just through the visual sort of aspect um was there any um, parameters that um terry kind of um set down i mean obviously he seems very open with you guys particularly but maybe that's a kind of a an iterative relationship and it wasn't immediately that way but did he lay any ground rules down for you in terms of what you could and couldn't shoot terry did not but you know uh, 12 monkeys was a, a studio film was a universal film so everybody around him laid down as many ground rules as you right. could possibly lay down but we quickly realized that we could go anywhere we want to as long as we stay cl as close as possible to terry um and terry was just fully willing to wear a wireless mic all the time never shut it off um so yeah, I mean, it, access to him was was key, and it actually didn't take very long to establish a pretty intimate relationship with him because he's such an open guy. You know, he doesn't yeah. he doesn't really ever feel like he's got anything to hide. There were two kind of um, they weren't rules, but they were kind of parameters that he gave us. Um, one of them was shoot everything. Yeah, and I'll tell you later. I, he said, "I won't censor you." shoot everything. I'll tell you later if I don't want you to include something. But typically the way this works is a documentary subject of a high profile will say, oh, don't shoot this, don't shoot this. And then later when everything works out fine, they wish you had shot it. Right. Um, so he, he had a, a, that was kind of, you know, a, a radical idea. And we've discovered in the process of making documentaries that not everybody is like that. But the other thing that he said, which I think really made an impact on us as young filmmakers, was he said, I don't want you to make a film that is what you think people want to see. I want you to make a film that's what you want to see. Um, and don't try and please me, just follow whatever you're interested in. Yeah. Um, which was a kind of encouragement that um, I think really liberated me and Keith to to chase all kinds of strange things, which end up being to us, I think, some of the most interesting things in the movie. Yeah, I mean, yeah and of course. In, oh, sorry. Go no, ahead. No, 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 I was just saying, in you know, a film industry, people were constantly telling us while we were making the hamster factor. Oh, no one wants to see that. No one wants to see that. No one wants to see a marketing meeting. No one wants to see a test screening. But you know, we we were fascinated by that stuff. We were still. Um, wide-eyed about these things hadn't had a lot of experience with uh you know uh, uh, big level movie production so you know I, th I think our curiosity um was very good for the filmmaking process there because we were just constantly wanting to document everything yeah um 
but you know, the film industry people are very sensitive about things like test screenings, particularly the one we captured in the hamster factor, which did not go very well. <laughs> well I was about to say that, that, that really plays like a horror sequence where like they've been making this film and then you have all these sheets coming in and then you have the kind of the group of people mm -hmm. sort of saying, um, I didn't like this and I didn't like that. Whereas they, um, you know, you've got Charles Roven and Terry kind of saying, but we were there with the audience and they were going with it and they liked it. So obviously you have that right. disconnect between what the cards say and what the filmmakers think and then yeah. Charles Roven, as far as I can tell, makes a fairly ballsy decision, which is to say we're not fucking changing. He did. You know? He did. And I, I mean, the, you know, the, 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 we were always talking while we were making the hamster factor, about the fact that we, the, the paradigm we were interested in is how do you, how do you force an art film through the Hollywood system? And Gilliam talks about that very openly in the film. Yes. So we were thinking like, okay, all the machinations of the system have to do with things like marketing and test screenings and the test screening, you know, although it was interpreted as having gone badly, you know, the, the, the creative people were thinking the vibe of the audience seems right. You know, they're, yes, they're baffled by things or confused by things they're supposed to be, you know. Um, it is it's also, there's a funny thing. The first, uh, I think the first sequence that we cut and showed to Terry was the sequence of the test screening because I was right. so excited to get down to work on that one and, and cross cut. There's a cross cutting between Gilliam out in the lobby of the theater talking excitedly to all these universal executives and saying like, people loved it. And then it cross cuts back into the theater where all the people in the audience are basically like, uh, we don't like this movie. <laughs> you know? But so that's the first thing to tell you the relationship with Terry. That's the first thing we chose to share with him. Right. And I remember him saying, you sure know how to hurt a guy. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but, but, I think that but he the, loved it. <laughs> the, the, the interesting quote, so I wrote this down, was that um, the, the quote that Charles Roven has literally just after that sequence is basically that yeah. his films are too big in scope, which means that the budgets require them to be for a broader audience. And so this is essentially the paradox. I mean, he, he delineates it very well. Um, right. Of Terry Gilliam's work, it seems, which is that his fantasy and his imagination is so big, but obviously the way that he treats the subjects can be niche. And so uh, mm. there's going to always be that battle for him in terms of how he gets the money to make something which is weird. Yeah, I, mean, I thought that was a fascinating point. Oh, uh, <laughs> no, I mean, the, the, I think, you know, one of the other things looking back on the hamster factor, which, which I now am quite struck by is that I don't think I had seen other behind the scenes films that really explored the relationship between the director and the producer. Producers are usually kind of yeah. shadowy figures, like we just assume they're they're dealing with money. Um, but and, and that became part of the uh, the central drama of the hamster factor was not just like Rovin as someone who knew how to navigate the Hollywood system, but Rovin is someone who constantly was challenging Terry to, you know, do it cheaper. It, Rowan would set down kind of system rules for Terry, like understanding what he was going to have to deal with with the studio. And Terry really thrived off of a producer who challenged him, who put limitations on him and made him think creatively. Um, and, and those kind, I mean, the hamster factor really gave us our first look at Terry's relationship with a kind of slightly combative process of creativity, mm. wanting the challenges, wanting someone to say, no, you can't do this, so that he had an extra kind of motivation to try to do it or to come up with a clever way to do it. Um, and, and I think also coming from film school at the time, we were so immersed in this auteur theory that you, you think everything comes out of the head of the artist. And a lot of times it's, it's about the, the sort of ecosystem of people that the artist has chosen to surround themselves with producers and all the other creative components and the actors and yeah. and and that was a very exciting thing to see with terry um is is how he embraces a a, a more organic process with lots of people and and this challenge that paradox of how how do you do this thing in the system um i think was was terry kind of latching on to um something that really fueled him creatively, gave him a lot of energy. Yeah, I mean, the thing that I was really impressed by was that they had, um, uh, there's the set designer who's there, who's never really discussed with anyone about what the time machine is supposed to look like. And then they find this old kind of um, uh, like power station and suddenly they realize that they can make the time machine out of the power station. And you can just see this kind of creative process like really kind of clicking into place. And it's really great to see because obviously, mm -hmm. you know, people, uh, all, all levels of filmmaking will face that same dilemma, which is we don't have enough money to do the thing we really want. How can we make it work on the money we have? And I, that was a fascinating right. insight I thought into that process. 
process. Well, Gilliam always talks also about the fact that those limitations are part of what inspires him, you know, and I, I think he's, um, he's also somebody, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't talk obsessively about my vision, my vision, my vision. He's always talking about that creative process, which is ideas coming from all around him. Yeah. I think he calls it leap, leapfrogging in the hamster factor. It's something he's very fond of in the creative process. Right. Oh, and then um, we are going to move on, but just um, uh, the, the last yeah. thing was that um, the title, The Hamster Factor, was actually come up with by the co-producer Lloyd Phillips, I think. Could you explain to yes. us quickly what The Hamster Factor was in terms of Terry and that shot with, with Bruce? Um, sure, I'll do that. Um, the Hamster Factor refers to some, it's like a big wide shot where Bruce Willis is, is naked in some lab that they had constructed in this um, you know, freezing cold power station. Um, and he has, you know, they need to do the shot quickly, but in the frame, Terry has placed a hamster in a wheel, which is super tiny in this big wide shot. Um, but Terry kept doing take after take because the hamster wasn't running. And so Lloyd um, Phillips referred to the hamster factor as Terry's tendency to focus on one obsessive detail that, that no one else will probably notice except for him, but that makes yeah. That, that makes the shot worth doing for him. So yeah. um, it, is, it is this um, perhaps uh, an Achilles heel of Terry to, to get fixated on one tiny little detail that, that could bring down the whole thing. Yeah. And so moving on to, um, to Lost in the Mantra. So, so obviously um, in terms of the three films that you made with Terry, um, the Hamster Factor kind of has um, like uh, it, the, the, the end of the first act is a happy ending in that the film takes $160 million and uh, everybody's very, very pleased. They, they stuck to their guns. They didn't compromise this the whole scene in the end about whether they showed the double ending with the guy getting on the plane and this discussion about whether it lands and, and the idea of art not necessarily having to explain everything, which I thought was wonderful to, to kind of delineate. Um, moving on to, to Lost in the Mantra, um, was that a sort of another negotiation again with the studio did he ask you back again like how did that one then come about he actually asked us i believe they one of the attempts at the production was in 1999 lou is that correct yeah i don't remember the dates clearly but we so terry approached us about coming on board that one but that one fell apart pretty quickly and we were actually a little bit on the fence about um doing another film we felt like all right we this, this is territory we've covered before right and I can't remember what it is that convinced us ultimately when Terry reapproached us in 2000. What was it, Lou? These stories um, are now foggy. A to mutual me. friend. So a guy named Ian Kelly, who was Terry's um, video assist guy, had been on Munchausen, had been on 12 Monkeys, which is how we knew him. And, and he said, oh, you should just go. Go to Spain. Put it on your credit card. Oh, yeah. um, he, he said... Right. Yeah, you've, you've seen this, but you know what? It's Terry, so something interesting is bound to happen. And of, of course, something very interesting did happen. But I think w one of the things that we had decided was if we're going to go and do a second film about Terry, it needs to be about a different part of the process. Right. Because we had come in on the hamster factor right as they were starting to shoot. Um, we said, oh, well, what are we curious about as filmmakers? Well, we've never seen how does a film come together? What is that process of the eight to 12 weeks before a film goes into production? What does that look like? And this, of um, course, was a very fortunate decision in the case of Lost in La Mancha because we arrived in Madrid, what, 10 weeks before they started shooting? Yeah, and, you know, had like we that. not made that decision, obviously, we would have not had a film at all um, because they, they, production only lasted six days. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we, we were, it's strange. We were reluctant to make Lost in La Mancha and we were reluctant to make He Dreams of Giants both, you know, because we, we kind of felt like, oh, we don't want to retread this old ground. But every time we go on a Gilliam adventure, it's a new one. Yeah. I mean, I don't know whether this um, ever uh, occurred to you guys in terms of the timeline of um, uh, making of films coming out, but one of the films, um, or the making ofs, I should say, that really connected with me was when the Lord of the Rings um, initial uh, move, uh, movie came out um, and they had the making of on the DVD then and obviously subsequent Blu-ray. One of the things that they did was that they weren't 
they weren't publicizing, they weren't putting out an EPK where everyone said he was great, she was great, it was all great. They actually showed the problems, they showed what went wrong, and then they showed how right. they fixed them. And I think that for filmmakers, particularly uh, myself, I, I know other people have responded to those as well. It was just like, fuck's sake, like, thank God somebody finally said it that, that there isn't an omnipotent force, all knowing and all seeing, who gets everything right all the time, no matter how much money you have. It's to do with whether right. the story works. And so I wondered whether you had seen The Hamster Factor and, and Lost in the Mansion. I mean, to, me, to my mind, the, 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 the Hamster Factor was one of the first films that really kind of like got under the skin of, of that process. And, and I don't know whether you saw Lost in La Mancha as like the kind of the next um, level of that in that you see it go spectacularly wrong, that you show things that you well, didn't normally see. We did in the sense as Lou mentioned. Well, I mean, obviously that was not, there was no intent in that because we didn't know that uh, Terry's production was going to uh, sure. crash. Um, but the, you know, the intent was what Lou described. So we thought, okay, well, let's 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 look very carefully at pre-production because we haven't done that before. You know, right. so we it, our our interest was continuing. You know, we we did EPK work after um, the Hamster Factor and before doing Lost in La Mancha, and you know, it's it's good work in one level. It was good, well-paying work at the time, but you know, the dealing with the studios and the marketing departments, you know, it's it's all about people don't want to see that. People don't want to see that. You know, yeah, it's yeah. all about what Lou and I used to refer to as funereal celebrity hoopla. <laughs> <laughs> but but what, this, what this did though, because we came from this as students in film school and, and making documentaries, and then we have this you know director hero of ours who says, oh, just make what you're interested in. Yeah, yeah. So when we started getting jobs shooting EPKs, people were like, oh, we want what you did in the hamster factor. And then you'd try and shoot it. <laughs> And you'd realize, oh, they don't really want that. Yeah. No. They aren't comfortable with the camera being on them when they're discussing a problem. Someone's thinking like, oh, shit, I screwed up. And there's a, the, the video guy is there like filming my moment of reckoning. And, um, and we would, on all of these other films, we would just get shooed away. And we would like bang our heads against this process until we realized, oh, we're actually trying to give them something much more than what they want. They want a shot that starts on a slate and zooms out to a wide <laughs> shot as a crane goes up. And they want lots of um, shots of the director patting the actors on the back and laughing. And, and, and the actor, to us, and the actors that was saying, boring. And the actors saying, well, it's the film's really hard to describe. It's so many genres, really. It's a comedy. It's a thriller. It's a love story. It's like it's every single one of them was the same, no matter what the movie was. I think the last <laughs> the, one. <laughs> go ahead. So it took us a while to realize, oh, the thing that draws us, like the conflict of filmmaking and how people solve those problems, a publicity department doesn't want that. No, that's not a, that's not a commercial for the film in their mind. Yeah. Um, so you have and, to have buy-in of the, of the person who's who's doing it to, to, to be able to push that through because otherwise the marketing department studio is going to say no, right. Right. So I think I think the absence of behind the scenes footage come that that shows you the reality of filmmaking comes from the fact that most of that was a process that's fostered by a marketing and publicity department that isn't interested in conflict. They yeah. don't want to sell, you know, a big studio movie on here were all the problems making it yeah people only like to know that that stuff exists after the film is a huge hit and then we get to relax and look at oh but now we struggled as brilliant artists to make this thing yeah um so it there's there's a weird catch in in the way the hierarchy of of the images about the image making are actually captured and, and yeah. disseminated so can you tell me what it was like when when the production started um, sort of going south and lost in the mansion and obviously it would seem to me that there's a kind of a, a, a real tension between you guys wanting Terry to succeed because you know and like him and and also thinking holy shit this is going to be like a really amazing bit of footage because the set just washed away and we captured it I don't know whether yeah. that's a, an inherent tension for you guys it must be quite hard. Well this is, this is a kind of long-standing joke between us and Terry, you know, because he, he's always saying, oh, you guys are so naive. You didn't see that the film was was going deeply south. And, and, and there was a sense that we had a belief that, you know, a production of this size and magnitude could not possibly fail, right? So as it was failing around us, I think Lou and I were both kind of like, well, I guess this is these are temporary bumps. This is not really going to take the thing down. 
Um, but it was enormously uncomfortable, you know. I mean, the, the, there were the six days of production, which were uncomfortable enough. But in the wake of that, you know, for a long time, there was still thinking that the film would get back on its uh, on its feet. Um, and uh, Lou and I were feeling more and more like vultures. You know, people were kind of looking at us like, why are you still filming? This is not what you came here to do. Right. You know, people who, who whom we had befriended. Um, and who trusted us and it, you know, it was a very uncomfortable feeling. And we, I remember we had a phone call with Terry in which he said to us, you know, you, you guys are probably the only one who are going to get a film out of this. So just keep shooting, shoot whatever you can, uh, which was heartening because we needed that kind of confidence. Um, but it's, you know, I think it's always uncomfortable when your documentary suddenly takes a turn that you didn't expect. Um, and suddenly you feel like an ambulance chaser. Um, but you know, the, the, it was important to continue to tell the story. Yeah, and um, and and what was the um, so as I understand it, the initial um, kind of um, in, impetus for that film was that it wasn't going to be theatrically released. But then, when the production went in that direction, did that suddenly become an option for you guys, or, or how did that 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 kind of last releasing part kind of manifest? This is, a, this is an irritating perception. I always wish I could remove it from the internet that we were always doing a behind the scenes featurette for this, for whatever the production company was, which we weren't. We were right. doing an independently financed film and had intended to do, you know, like an hour long piece for, you know, about the pre-production of the film. But yes, the theatrical potential uh, came because Terry's film wasn't going to exist. You know, we had, we had this amazing disaster story, uh, which we obviously didn't expect to get. Yeah. Um, and that was also a time when uh, there weren't a lot of big theatrical documentaries. You know, there had been, I guess, the, the hoop, there had been Hoop Dreams, right, Lou, and Roger Moore's film. Um, well, you know, 2000 was, was the beginning of this rise of the theatrical documentary. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And, and we, we, were, we were kind of able to ride that wave. And also, as you know, people who had studied what is out there that's feature length documentary about the making of movies, we mm -hmm. realized, oh, there is no verite film about a movie collapsing. No Never. one has recorded that. That doesn't exist. Yes, there's hindsight stories about it, but this is something unique. And, you know, well, we, there had been we went of dreams and there had been uh, hearts of darkness, right? Oh, but those darkness, weren't, yeah. those were about films that actually were, were successful in the end. Right. Um, so our producer went back to the financiers and because we told her, like, uh, go back to them and tell them if they give us more money, we can give them something that's like a level up, which is a whole feature uh, that no one has ever seen before. Yeah. Um, and, and that was kind of how it, it took off. But, you know, we had come from film school where we sat around talking about the ethics of documentary filmmaking. So it was a big um, obstacle for us to make sure that Terry was on board with, are you comfortable with us showing, yeah. you know, he's, he's like saying like, I had to drag Keith and Lou, you know, to the set to make sure they filmed the last day of production. Um, the other That's thing was true. that no one actually told us what was going on. So how we would have known when we were like, we were the most naive people there. To, to us, it's like, of course a film can't collapse, you know? This this is, is, yeah. There's a story we need to tell, Lou, just, just briefly, because um, Lou made reference to Terry uh, sort of uh, th theoretically dragging us out of bed to come to the sixth day of production, which was the last day of production. We didn't know it was going to be the last day of production, but I think he did. Right. And um, that was the day that all these financiers who were, I think, a busload of German dentists arrived on the set to see Johnny Depp doing his thing. And uh, Terry basically, you know, wanted us there for the comedy of it, <laughs> because his gallows humor at work again. Uh, but we we had not intended to go that day. We were we were back in Madrid doing whatever we needed to do, uh, you know, looking at footage and whatnot. Um, but his he had his daughter Amy. Was it Amy who called us? Lou? No, it was his assistant who called us. His assistant me. called us and said, uh, "Terry really wants you guys here today." And we're like, uh, "We don't want to go," but we went um, and got a great scene out of it. That was a scene that actually we cut it a few times and Terry kept saying, it's not funny enough, you know? Um, so we, we would amp up the comedy as much as we could. 
I wonder if there have there've been any um, uh, reactions from filmmakers um, that have been passed on to you guys having seen that film. I mean, obviously for many people, it's like the kind of the, the, um, the epitome of like how badly it can go wrong and like how heartbreaking it must be for that. <laughs> yeah. You've spent years getting to the point where you've got a camera and an actor and suddenly it's not happening anymore. Have you ever had other filmmakers that, uh, that, that have sort of expressed that kind of um, sentiment to you that have, have seen the film? Um, yeah, I mean, I often run into people who are like, oh my God, I saw that in film school. They like make us watch that to prepare oh. us. Um, the ones that I actually really enjoy is that, you know, out on the internet, there are all these like PhD thesis papers about <laughs> how it, it's all a big um, construct. Like we were the masterminds behind the collapse of the okay. film. And I, I love and, that idea. Yeah. And they, as if, you know, this was a secret plot between us and Terry Gilliam to make a true <laughs> postmodern documentary adaptation of Don Quixote. And um, no, I, I kind of, I kind of like the way that in the sort of film scholars all come up with much more convoluted versions of, um, of what happened uh, to kind of, it's, it's almost like a, a film theory conspiracy, uh, mm. you know, the, anyway. But obviously, you can you can also imagine that um, uh, whilst Terry, um, from an artistic point of view, is really into you guys documenting the process because he sees some value in that, you can also imagine that it could potentially be damaging to him commercially because obviously he got this badge of being a filmmaker who was irresponsible. So if a film goes down on his watch, like you could imagine him going, well, that's going to make it harder for me to raise finance on future projects. So it wasn't without risk for him, sure. No, and I, I think Lost in La Mancha was baggage for him, was, was his albatross to wear around the neck for quite some time for that reason. Um, obviously, he still made you know many films between um, um, that time and when he finished The Man Who Killed Don Quixote recently. Yeah. But, I, you know, he was dragging a reputation around with him. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, this is an interesting thing about him as a, as a filmmaker is that reputation, you know, was built from Brazil Munchausen yep. um, and it's an unjust reputation in a way when you meet Terry and when you see Terry work he's super responsible about money he's he's super responsible about schedule and he's he's a very practical filmmaker he thinks about everything in terms of how am I going to make this how am I going to craft this in a tangible way but one of the things about the system is the system loves the persona of the crazy out of control artist mm. um and you know it's 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 what they glamorize about coppola in hearts of darkness what they glamorize about um herzog in burden of dreams is there's something that the culture loves about the the crazy artist oh and they also manage to like create a masterpiece um, and that myth is something that film directors, I think, are constantly saddled with in terms of, um, you know, we approach a lot of our, our, our projects as craftspeople trying to make something. But there's this audience, which is somewhat like the decision makers and the buyers and the studio people and film festivals. They want the character of a film director as well. They want you to be a little bit crazy arrogant um throwing a temper tantrum and more filmmakers that i've met than not are they don't have those personalities and terry certainly doesn't have that personality yeah. but i think he also kind of courted that reputation a little bit because that also you know there's the we want him but we're afraid of him yeah. um I mean, I Dynamic. guess also to, to to remember that the you know the reason that um, Bruce Willis and Brad Pitt um, you know wanted to do uh, Twelve Monkeys was because of Terry Gilliam. So like you know you you have the idea of the guy who's going to do something weird or or crazy, even though that wasn't his project and he didn't as in he didn't develop the material. Um, and and so you kind of think well they knew what they were buying. Like you you that, that you you're buying that Terry Gilliam um, you know world and that attitude and that approach. So you kind of feel they don't have much to, to say about like you know the craziness because that's what they wanted I, I think yeah i think it's just an it's a strange catch-22 for a lot of filmmakers um, so let's move on to um, uh, to the, the the newest film. So um, um, he dreams of giants um, is um, I guess you could say it's a, would you call it a sequel to Lost in La Mancha or is it a continuation? How do you see the two films in terms of how they relate to each other? 
We have a way of seeing the three films, which, what, what, what is it, uh, Gillagy? Is that what you're calling it? <laughs> Someone recently started calling it a Gillagy. I thought, why didn't I think of that? But yeah. The, the three films, uh, we, we've got a system for thinking about them. Now, the hamster factor we thought of as being man against the system because it's about Terry's battle against the Hollywood machine trying to get an art film through the system. Yeah. And Lost in La Mancha being man against nature because it's, uh, you know, battling these enormous forces, godlike forces of nature that are against him to try to get his film done and failing, Job-like. Um, and then He Dreams of Giants as being mad against himself right. <laughs> because it's a very interior film. Um, it takes an extremely different approach to the other two. Um, and <clears throat> you spend most of the film or a good portion of the film kind of in Terry's head. Yeah. Uh, with all the stuff that he's been carrying around for the twenty year, almost twenty years between Lost in La Mancha and this one, yeah. Um, the, and the burden mainly the patient. You've got you know all these people thinking, all right, Terry Gilliam never made his masterpiece, and now finally he's on the precipice, right? Yeah. And in his mind, that expectation was not something he wanted to be up against. You know, yeah, it's he seemed- had no expectation that this was going to be his masterpiece or anything else. He just needed to get it out of his head, as he kept telling us over and over and over again. Yeah. Well, there was, a, there was a very kind of telling moment, which I think might be in the clip that you sent through. So we'll, we'll, we'll check that out in a minute. Yeah, sure. It, it was about kind of, yeah, as you say, the weight of expectation. And you kind of think, well, surely after this, um, uh, I mean, just, just to recap the timeline, he first started developing the project in 1989. Um, and then the first shoot was in 2000, obviously, which you guys covered. Your film came out in 2002. Um, and then the, the third shoot was in, tw- well, the, the film was released in 2018. So I'm assuming it was the year before that. Um, so um, obviously, you know, you're looking at almost, um, you know, 1989, 1999, 2000, you're looking at, you know, almost 30 years. Yep. Um, were, there, were there lessons that, that, that you took away, not necessarily that were in the film, but like just in terms of seeing him work or maybe seeing yourselves work um, in a similar sort of set of parameters over that length of time? Were there any kind of things that you, you kind of took away from, from seeing that process over such a long period? Well, that the artistic process is pain. <laughs> this is something that Lou and our collaboration always reminds me. We get we get to a point in either production or post production of a film, and I'm complaining all the time. And is Lou saying, "Stop complaining. This is the process. This is what it's supposed to feel like. It felt like this last time, and you don't remember. You blocked it out." Um, and it it is painful. It was painful for Lou and I to be back again with Terry Gilliam almost 20 years later and particularly painful to see him not having that much fun, you know, really actually suffering from a lot of uh, um, anxiety and lack of confidence and also, you know, physical issues and any number of things. So, I mean, while He Dreams of Giants is a film about an aging artist, I mean, it also is a reflection of ourselves having, you know, been on this journey with Terry Gilliam for so long. And also, you know, we were like, when we're making He Dreams of Giants, we're looking back at all this footage from Lost in La Mancha, we're thinking, all right, how much do we include ourselves? How much are we characters in this new film? So we're looking at all this old footage of us when we're very young men, you know, which is a sort of painful mirror to hold up. And we're thinking, like, how have we developed as artists in these past 20 years? You know, have we lived up to our own expectations of ourselves? It was a, it was a very much a, a mirroring process, you know, Terry's experience to, to our experience. But I, but I think that what you just said was obviously very important for you guys to have it in, in terms of being able to see the progression of like Hamster Factor to Lost in the Mansion to what this film is. Because obviously, as you say, as you said, when you were looking at Lost in the Mansion, you don't want to go and retread old ground for like, you know, but we're not going to make the same film again. So, no. so I guess that was important for you guys to have understood that about why you were going back, obviously. Yeah. There's um, also, I think, a, an evolution that we had as, as filmmakers, especially making documentaries. And, and, you know, we made a fiction feature, but, but the bulk of our career has been making documentaries. But when we started, the, I think the idea that we had about documentary was the fly on the wall approach, which is this idea that you are a, a silent, passive observer who um, is hopefully not noticed. And that was very much the case on um, The Hamster Factor, a little less so on um, Lost in La Mancha because Terry and a lot of the people in that production knew us from 12 Monkeys. Um, But coming back for He Dreams of Giants, you know, we had made other films in between. And most recently we had made this film called The Bad Kids, which is an observational documentary in an American alternative high school for kids who are at risk of dropping out. 
and I think we learned in that process, like, oh, the documentarian is not a passive fly on the wall. You are a witness. And a witness is a very different kind of role. It's an active role, even though we think, well, what is the witness doing other than looking? Um, but, but that's when Keith talks about this mirroring. There is a, there's a whole reflecting back. I think this was also why Terry, why, why despite our hesitance, like, should we really go and do this? It's like, no, we have to go and do this because it's it's our role to watch the end of this, to be there to see this happen. Yeah. Um, it was actually Tony Grissoni who was the, the the flea in our ear saying, you have to go and do this. It is your responsibility to do this. We're like, Tony, really? And, and there was a way, it's, I especially kind of didn't want to. I thought like, no, I've actually evolved as a filmmaker. I don't want to be back on a movie set. I hate being on movie sets. Um, but that, that witness role is, is, I think, different because in a way you have to carry the emotion of what you're watching um, and, and you have to be willing to hold it. And that was painful because of what Terry was going through or what I sort of perceived that he was going through. Yeah. Um, and, and yeah, yeah. So that, that was, it was a big difference. I think another thing that we learned was that that, you know, granted, we now went from being like film students in our late 20s to middle aged men. And I think our view of the filmmaking process, I could see ways that it diverged from Terry's view of the filmmaking process, because I very much view documentary almost as like the art of documentary is the relationship between you, the filmmaker and the people that are your subjects. And the film is almost an artifact of that. And I think for Terry, um, Terry's like, what? No, no, you're saying it's all about the process. It's very much about the end product. Um, and I, I don't know, that was, it was kind of an interesting difference of opinion about what is the value in the artistic process? Is it the end result mm -hmm. or is it the undertaking of it and, and everything that's involved in that undertaking? And I think we landed more on the side of, oh, it's the process and the undertaking. Um, if, you, if you judge all artistic endeavors by the end result, then you, you're in a very, that was worth it and that wasn't worth it. And I don't think, I think we kind of view this different than Terry. Yes. Oh, you're, is it? I'm bringing up. Yeah, your video just is freezing. Oh, uh, maybe you're oh. maybe, uh, maybe you're catching up again now. It looks like you're buffering a little bit. Shall we? Um, uh, should yeah. we just show the um, uh, the trailer of the film to give everybody kind of a sense of it? Because uh, obviously the film is not out here until the 29th of March. Sure. Um, so um, sure. it might be nice for everyone to get a quick sense of it. So if we'll, do, I'm going to try and share this screen, and hopefully the audio will work, and we'll try that now. And here we go. The idea that art should be fun. Who the f invented that story? Okay. Oh, it just keeps coming up again and again, and it keeps crashing. So do you think you're there? Another disaster befalls. The film finally seemed to be moving forward after seven failed attempts in almost two decades. It's been such a long obsession. Everybody's in place. Everybody's happy. It's a great reunion. Slightly older people. An action! This is good. This is excellent. Okay, stop. We're doing everything completely wrong. Fuck this. We're going to fuck ourselves right now. This is the furthest we have ever been. And there's no stopping us now. I was getting ready for bed. And I just see blood is pouring out of my body. Am I dying here? after all of this time on the film, and I die before we finish it. I still get excited about things. I want to make things. Once it's done, there's a great void waiting for me, and that scares the shit out of me. Don't finish it. Leave it as a dream. Life is hard. 
part is part towards the end. So you're pondering you to change the world. Then you make a difference. Was the audio playing on there okay? Mm -hmm. Great. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the thing, the thing that you um, uh, you mentioned before, um, Keith, was um, of something that I really took from it, which was that there was a real tension for me um, because you're just so fucking worried about him. Like, you know, he's obviously going through something as he's 80 now, I think. Is that right? Yeah, he is. Yeah. And obviously, you know, people who've been on film shoots know that they are, you know, physically exhausting. And, and so, um, you know, without going into detail, he has some, you know, health issues towards the end. Were, were you worried about him? Were you guys worried about him personally, like in terms of watching him and seeing what he was going through? Yeah, extremely worried about him. I, I was actually in, in Madrid uh, with him before Lou showed up. Um, and, uh, you know, I found myself oftentimes sort of playing the role of caretaker more than documentarian, <laughs> you know, because he was not feeling well or he wasn't getting any sleep. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I, I feel powerfully for the guy. So it, it was not fun to watch him going through this. Um, and, you know, He Dreams of Giants holds a very, you know, tight microscope to what he's going through, which is in, in some ways, it's difficult for him to watch. It's difficult for us to watch. Yeah. But, you know, we, we, we really wanted to, um, to make people feel viscerally what it was like to be in his shoes, you know. So we do. We really didn't pull any punches in that sense. The um, the, the the most arresting shot for me was there's a shot where he's watching the monitor, and and you can see his face kind of not necessarily acting out, but he's kind of reacting to you know whatever you can't see because you're not where the monitor is, and um, it's just um, yeah, it's it's kind of this 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 um, intense face of concentration and hope and oh my god it's going to go wrong any second and we're running out of time and just all of those emotions playing on his face i thought it was like a real like kind of wow moment i was very impressed that that was well, this, this is a revelation for us um i forget at which point in the process i think we were we were in london lou um doing further production this is when we went to london to shoot the the studio stuff the white room um and our editor uh back in um or in LA had put together a, a four hour selects reel. We'd asked him to take all the shots of Terry's face, just these long studies of Terry's face that we'd been doing over the course of the production, string them all together with the you know music from our composer. And uh, Lou and I had watched this four hour selects reel and we thought, oh my God, you know, this is the movie. You know, a lot of people would think, oh, that sounds really boring, but um, Lou became extremely interested in doing these long takes of Terry because it was so much going on in the face, you know. We had, had a, like a prior, very experimental version of this film, which was much more like a, a film specifically going on in Terry Gilliam's head. And we'd, we'd done something that was a little bit radical. We liked that cut of the film, but I don't think it would have had as, as broad of an audience, wasn't as accessible. Yeah. Um, but I think that that quality still exists in the finished film, He Dreams of Giants, because he, you know, it feels like you are inside this tortured man's head. Yeah. Not that he's a tortured man, but he's, he, he was tortured about coming to this production because it was so much baggage. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm looking at the clock, which is that it's um, quarter to eight um, yep. here in the UK. And um, so um, in about five minutes time, I'm going to ask everyone um, if they're comfortable with doing so to turn their video cameras on. And we'll do about 10 minutes of questions from the people who are kind of with us live, if that's okay. Um, and I had a couple of um, questions um, which kind of feed into what you were saying about um, Terry um, as the kind of the central character of this. And, and I guess um, what I was going to ask you was um, in the film, um, he makes um, references to... Um, um, Fellini's eight and a half um, and, and, and the fact that this, you know, he kind of feels is the, um, the, the film which is most closely captured for him, what it feels like to be a director and, you know, this idea of temporal um, kind of stability being, um, you know, mm -hmm. not, not fixed. Is it going on now? Is it later? Is it chart or whatever? Um, do you, did you get a sense um, um, of, of him um, seeing himself in relation to Quixote or to Fellini? I mean, he talks about it a little bit, but maybe you had, um, some thoughts on how he saw himself in relation to those two characters. Well, the Fellini thing is interesting because, you know, Eight and a Half is one of my favorite films. It's one of Keith's favorite films. It's one of Terry's favorite films. And we would have these moments on the set where 
you know, we'd show up and we'd see something and Keith and I would look at each other and say like, oh my God, this is like a moment out of eight and a half. And then Terry would walk by and he'd say like, did you see that? It's like a moment out of eight and a half. <laughs> and um, and I, I think it's a, it's a, both a temptation, but an inevitability that as artists, we're always kind of projecting ourselves into different stories and trying to understand our experience through the narratives that we know about other artists um I, I i certainly feel that with eight and a half I, you know i often would say to terry like um i think you're not an eight and a half or don quixote anymore you're in moby dick and uh <laughs> you you might be the captain of the ship here and that's not a good you know that's not a good role to play but i think you know the the quixote comparisons are are very relevant we're constantly doing that um, of course, the interesting thing about Quixote for me is that the, the narrative changes depending on what point in life you are. So to me and Keith reading this when we were in our 30s, it's like, oh, it's the story of a dreamer and, you know, they're battling reality valiantly. Reading it again in my 50s, I thought, and, and after having watched Terry go through this, I'm like, oh my God, this is a film about a guy who knows that his life is coming to a close and he's trying to figure out what's going to be remembered of him after he's gone yeah and and i feel that strand that was a i mean that's a big strand in he dreams of giants was trying to capture that feeling um but yeah i think we're we're constantly haunted by those different narratives and terry of course loves to see himself as job um just suffering blindly for something he has faith in um but obviously, so, you, I, I guess you have to assume that he must have some sort of incredible connection or pull to that character. So his quote was, um, Quixote is an old man whose body is failing, who has one last chance to make the world as interesting as he dreams it to be. Um, and you kind of think, well, the, if you're going to keep going at something for 30 years, like rather than just giving it up, and, and he does muse on that idea, should I leave it in you know, the fantasy realm in my memory rather than, or my mind rather than doing, you know, he, he must have some deeply personal connection to that. That, that character you'd think otherwise what's the point you know like you, you just do something else so yeah I, I mean I don't think it's a mistake that that's a narrative that has survived for centuries and it's, it's something that speaks to who, who we are as human beings um, and and the expectations we have for what our life is going to mean what we're going to be remembered as um, last question, and then we'll throw it to questions. Um, so, um, uh, what was Terry's um, uh, uh, experience um, viewing the film? I'm assuming you sat down with him and, and watched it, or did you do that together, or how, how did that work out when, when you watched it with him, or when he saw it? Fortunately, we never sat in the same room and watched it with him. That would, that would have been interesting. He obviously, it's not a film he likes to watch. You know, I mean, I think I think he has respect for what it is, and he's you know didn't didn't cause any trouble in in the approval process. But I mean, how could he possibly want to watch this movie? You know, it's it, it's 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 about as warts and all as it gets, um, and it you know it reminds him of some things he doesn't want to be reminded of. He also, because our memories work this way, he remembers this this experience of trying to get the man who killed Don Quixote made in 2017 as being better than it was. <laughs> you know, he remembers it as being happier and more cheerful than it was. Right. And, you know. Our perspective, the story we wanted to tell is obviously, you know, documentary filmmakers don't just tell the truth, they tell a particular, you know, angle on the truth or their own particular personal truth. And the truth we wanted to tell was, you know, of the, of the pain of the artistic process, you know, yeah. particularly when you're trying to do something you've been trying to do for 30 years. So, um, no, he's, I, I don't think he's, he would be the best audience for this film, <laughs> but he... He approved of it, so. I, yeah, I mean, I, I was hoping that, that, that maybe he saw it in the same way that you guys did, which was that there was this huge, valiant artistic effort, which was, you know, a horribly difficult road strewn with boulders and lightning, but he did make it at the end. And, and, and <laughs> is, is that the important thing? I don't know, maybe it's not. Maybe the, he, maybe, maybe the struggle and the fight and the journey is the important thing. This is interesting, right? Because this was, a, this was actually a point of contention between us and Terry. Our belief is that the, the struggle and the pursuit is what matters. His belief is that 
yes, that matters, but also the end result very much matters. And yeah, I mean, both are true, but I think Lou and I were more interested in the struggle part, right. you know, because in the part which is inspiring to other people as well, whether you, whether you get something finished or not, or whether what you get finished is any good or not, it matters that you try, right? So that I think that's more more of what interested us. We yeah. argued with Terry about that point all the time. He's like, "What's the point if it's not a great film?" You know. It's, so, <laughs> well, I, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, he he got his um, twenty two minute long um, uh, standing ovation at Cannes, um, and and yeah. I guess you know that you know obviously Cannes is one of those places that likes auteurs and likes film struggle, but they do boo the shit out of you if they don't like it. So <laughs> yeah. there, 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 there is something to be said for that. Um, mm -hmm. uh, if it's okay, guys, um, uh, would we be all right to put our cameras on, um, and then I'd like to get a few questions in the last sort of ten minutes, if that's okay. So um, if anybody is there and watching um and they would like to unmute their microphone um then um, we can have a question um for um keith and um louis which would be great who can i see smiling there hello chris how's it going yeah good man good good um hey guys i have always absolutely adored the hamster factor it's just fucking brilliant um and yeah they're all, all the film since but like um big question about the hamster factor the kid who gets replaced did they already have another kid already on set he was already there so it was kind of like okay well just in case yeah. you're in case you're shit <laughs> this you know that guy that sat there yeah yeah he will take your job this was an interesting thing about this is what you're talking about is the kid who was playing the young bruce willis and um <clears throat> the interesting thing is that the producer, Chuck Roman, didn't trust the choice that Terry had made and, and thought, okay, we got to have this other kid because this other kid was really good, right? So t Terry chose the kid who, who got replaced because he had amazing eyes, right? Yeah. But he wasn't an amazing. He wasn't an amazing actor. <laughs> you know, he didn't have that discipline that the other kid had. So I think Chuck Roman anticipated and was very smartly. So, so yeah, it's it's kind of funny that there's just some other kid in the wings. So they pull it. <laughs> it's the harshest, the harshest <laughs> moment in that. I know, film. poor kid. No. Yeah. What, what was said to the kid who got replaced? What, how did that? I have no idea. Yeah. <laughs> I hope I hope he's still okay and has a wonderful career. <laughs> I, was, I was genuinely hoping that, that the first kid didn't get to see the second kid wheeled on. I hope they managed to get <laughs> him out of there without having, here's the better kid coming in there. I, I, I really hope that that happened. I think they did it in a delicate way. <laughs> but. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, who else um, uh, might have a question for the guys? Um, I can see Harley. Harley, do you have anything you might want to jump in? You got to unmute your microphone, dude. Okay. Um, to the filmmakers, uh, I was interested how much of um, Terry's family was involved in the production. Terry told me that his daughter was producing the film for him. Uh, so uh, Amy Gilliam, Terry's oldest daughter, uh, was one of the producers of The Man Who Killed Don Quixote. Um, and, you know, she's kind of stepped up to k help him get a lot of his projects off of the ground in the past, uh, I don't know, decade. I can never keep track of how old she is. When, when I first met her, I think she was 16, and she's not 16 anymore. Um, so I keep thinking of her as, you know, Terry's daughter, but She's, you know, a film producer, and she she was very, very integrally in involved in um, in getting the money uh, and and making sure that Terry had what he needed to to make the film. So. What do you think's next for Terry? I have no idea. Um, I don't know what Terry thinks is next for Terry. We haven't been in touch with him in a while. Um, are there any burblings? We know he was said he was no? doing some Stanley Ku there was some Stanley Kubrick unfilmed script or or something like that that he had been trying to make and then the pandemic shut everything down. You know, filmmaking right now is is hard to do. It's hard to get projects off the ground. It's hard to plan for productions. Um, so I'm I'm not sure. I you know I know he was doing. Um, some opera stuff and potentially doing a big musical uh whatever whatever he does i i hope he's 
doing stuff that doesn't involve him being out in a desert somewhere in a windstorm. So. Yeah. Can I ask um, um, how you guys have been um, coping during the uh, the lockdown? Have you been able to carry on working or has things ground to a halt a little bit or have you been developing? How's it played out for you? Well, thing, things involving money in our pockets have ground to a halt, but this, uh, we've actually been making a film the whole time. In, in April, we started, we put out a call for work to filmmakers all around the U.S. Um, to get to, get them to do these long takes that would tell based on certain criteria that would tell their ex emotional experience of the pandemic which we've been spending months now cutting into a really bizarre experimental documentary that feels like a science fiction horror film um you know it's it's, it's got uh, all these excerpts from people's dreams that they've been having during this period and this is a very strange film we're almost done with it so we, we've actually had a great surge of creative creative energy during this um which has been great a lifesaver yeah and and a good substitute for the fact that mostly what we like to do is shoot verite but you can't you can't go and film a bunch of people where you're three feet away from them in a small room and you know i've seen a couple of things that are you know shot in the past year that are like scenes of people in masks and i'm like uh you know, I'm I'm a filmmaker who's all about the human face, so I don't really want to just see um, no. <laughs> people wearing masks. We'll say also that the pandemic uh, in Los Angeles is much more fun than the pandemic, I'm sure, is in London. So, um, you know, we can be outside all, all the time right. and sit out in the yard and have fires and have friends over, and you know, it's not the same drizzly experience. Yeah. 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 You, you, are the tra taco trucks still cruising around in LA? <laughs> yes, yeah. there are. Many a I meal has been them. had. <laughs> we have one right down the street. Um, do, we have, um, do we have any more questions for, uh, for the guys? Oh, Kate, go for it. Hi. No, I was, I was just going to say um, thank you for. I watched um, La Mancha this afternoon and it was, it was really interesting seeing it. And I think it certainly for me, because I hate this thing about the author and that we're meant to all aspire to. And I think it was really good seeing how much Terry Gilliam cared and that he was more organized. And, mm -hmm. and he just had such bad luck on that film. I mm -hmm. mean, and because I've just been filming up in Scotland on Outlander and we had, you know, pandemic, but I had one scene that was cross bordered to the next block and we had two foot of snow and I had to wait for a week, this bloody scene. And then the very morning, <laughs> the actor kept, rang in with a temperature at five in the morning. So I had to shoot half a scene with, with an essay. We found an essay that looked like him. So it, so seeing what he went through, I was just going, oh, fuck you, poor man. Uh, <laughs> so, so I think that, that was really interesting and brilliant. And I think it, you know, it helps all filmmakers to understand what people go through. And I don't know, and just see, just see what the, help see what the process sometimes is like you know mm -hmm. that we're not alone in this as it were it and i also like had to replace yeah. a boy that's awful when you said that it's something like before that happened to me because we had this sorry i'm just digressing but um we had this boy that we cast over zoom because everything was like self tapes and he looked fine and then he went into costume and i went in to see costume and they said oh that boy that came in um he's much larger than we thought and I went, oh shit, because he's meant to be like this young boy. And I said, I, I had to ring all the producers in LA and go, look, I'm, I don't want to frighten you all, but um, costume said this boy doesn't fit in, in any of the in any of the costumes they had for him. And we, the person who's meant to be his mother is particularly short. Um, and I just think you should check it out. So anyway, they all got him measured, and and he was indeed because he was meant to be pulling at his mother's skirt. And he was like only four inches shorter than her. So he was actually a forty-year-old man. You know. We had to replace him. That was, that was really bad. But anyway, um, can I um, uh, ask? I, I, it feels like it might be. I'm um, getting um, close to the end. Um, is there any more questions? I've got one last question. Um, if uh, nobody else has one, but does anyone else want to chip in with one before we um, before we? Chris, Chris wants to go. Go for it, Chris. Uh, yeah. The the films like Lost the Matcher and, and The Hamster Factor really give a sense of the futility of being a director. <laughs> like, I just wonder if you've got a sense of like, it always feels like he's, he, he looks quite helpless. And there is that sense of, you know, when you're, I've made a lot of films low budget where it's just me and my brother doing stuff and we've made bigger size stuff. And usually when you're in the bigger size stuff, as a director, you are sort of sat there going, 
oh, I don't have to do very much. What am I supposed to do right now? So I can <laughs> totally see like him focusing on that hamster is a little bit like, well, what else am I supposed to do? This guy is the one putting the camera up and the lights and all of, you know, it's kind of like, there are obviously is, a million questions you got, but this is why it's much, uh, much better to be a documentary di director, because if you don't do anything, nothing happens at all, you know? So, yeah. <laughs> no, but I, re I remember actually Terry, Terry prefers the smaller mode of filmmaking. I mean, he's got these big visions, but he, he actually likes to be in the trenches doing it. And I remember there were a couple of days, uh, you know, on He Dreams of Giants, which I think will really, um, really make you feel the futility of being a film director. Um, but there were a couple of days where the crew was super small and it would just be a few people and Terry would, would get excited when he would be like, oh my God, I get to do something. I get to, you know, we're all, everybody's got three roles instead of like uh, just, you know, the very rigid thing. He likes that, that sort of troop of, troop of craftspeople all kind of working together to make something happen. Yeah. Um, it's more engaging, I think. You're, you're in it. Yeah, for sure. Um, can I ask um, uh, if there is um, any kind of sense that you guys have of, of what your next projects might be? Have you got anything that you're particularly excited about that you can tell us about? Um, obviously, you're working on your pandemic um, doc, which sounds really cool. Do you have a name for that? And can you tell us about any other projects that you're currently considering or, or, or lining up? The name of the experimental pandemic doc is Testament currently. Um, and we were, we, we actually had something lined up and, and ready to go uh, in the middle of last year, which completely fell apart due to the pandemic. So that was uh, not good. Mm. But we're, we're working on a bunch of different things. It's just, it's very difficult to actually do anything right now, especially in the documentary world. It's the, it's I mean, documentary is is shifting too, um, because it's been so dominated by streaming services. There's there's a push for more things that are either celebrity, true crime, or or newsy. Um, so a lot of the things that we're developing are still like trying to get back to verite, um, very intimate portraits of people living their lives and and doing stuff. Um, we will never be returning to the set of another movie uh, <laughs> as documentarians. So you no, that's it. You're, you're done on the uh, the on set, um, yeah, kind of like tell alls. Hope, hopefully. Yeah. But also on a movie set, you're always in someone's way. You're always in the wrong place. You sit there patiently waiting to line up a shot. And then like right as it's about to happen, some PA steps in front of the camera and you can't yell at them because you're the odd man out. Um, no, we, I think we'll stick to documentaries about real people as opposed to documentaries about movie people from now is, on. Is there, is there a sense that you have of, um, of, of the way that you mentioned the way that documentary is going? Like, I, I was just thinking of films like Bloody Nose, Empty Pockets, kind of those, like, kind of those crafted, you know, kind of like um, hybrid kind of pieces, maybe. I don't know whether you've ever uh, seen that is the best film. I'm, I'm happy you mentioned that film. We saw that at Sundance um, in the, what, in 2020, right before the pandemic hit. We, we'd seen a bunch of different things at Sundance and uh, that was the only one that really stood out for us. It was amazing. Those guys had such a hard time selling that film. I think they finally did. Yep. It's now on streaming services. Is it in the UK as well? Um, I, I believe so. Um, I've seen it in an advanced kind of screener, but yeah. um, I, I think um, the, very very jealous of that film it's beautiful yeah yeah that's the kind of documentary that i wish we could make um <laughs> in fact if you have if you have a pair of pliers and can guarantee that i can make a documentary like that you can take out four of my teeth you choose which four you want as long as i can make a film like that so oh, that's, that's a bold offer i'm not sure i'm really up kind of aggressive <laughs> Um, I think we um, um, have been um, uh, very much um, uh, appreciative of your time, um, guys, and I feel like that maybe we've come to the end of our, our chat, if that's okay. Um, so what I'd like to do um, is um, uh, thank um, Keith um, Fulton and Louis Pepe for, for such an amazing and, and wonderfully open um, chat. Do put your microphones on and give them a, a chat and a yay if you want to. Um, but um, thank you very much for, for joining us, guys. And I, I want thank to make you. Um, everyone thank knows. Thank you very much. Yeah. No, thank you. Um, mm -hmm. The film is out on... And, and good luck. Good luck with the next. Doctor. <laughs>
Thank you. Uh, the film is out for streaming on March the 29th. We'll be pushing it out to our channels again and to our mailing lists. Um, and if you fancy checking it out, He Dreams of Giants will be on all major streaming services, I'm told. Um, so um, thank you very much for your, for your time, guys. Um, it's a great film, and uh, we wish you the best of luck. Thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye -bye. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.